everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm Z Garcia. Hi. Sam Healy. Welcome back, folks. All right, so it's Board Game Breakfast Live. We have lots of things to go over today with lots of different segments for you. Because this is live, and you might be watching it later, but if you are watching it live, we want to communicate with you. If you have comments about something we're saying, talk, maybe we'll answer. Maybe we won't. But at we'll... least you know you're there. Wow. Is that how that works? I don't think so. Ah, okay. Hey, today is the last day of our Kickstarter. It ends at midnight or 12.01, actually, tonight. We'll be doing a live stream. I'll be here with a few other guys. We'll play some games and just kind of finish out the Kickstarter. It's You guys have been amazing. Thank you to everyone who backed it. That's just been fantastic. Also, later on today at 2 o'clock, we'll be doing a live um, uh, top, top 10, 10 list. Top 10. Top 10 things that get me excited about a new game. Cats is my number one. Oh, I'm spoiling it. Cats. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Cat poop. <laughs> Pooples. Yeah, Pooples. Pooples is not going to make the list. All righty. Well, let's get started today. Here we go with the news. Do, 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 do. Today we're going to look at an Academy Games game called Conflict of Heroes Awakening the Bear 2nd Edition. This is a two-player game and it takes place in Russia, around Russia, between the Germans and the Russians. What's cool about Academy Games is that they have a lot of other games on their roster which are mostly Euro-style war games. So Conflict of Heroes has an easy-going mechanic which is good for you. This is a tactical, scenario-based impulse game, meaning that you play certain scenarios, it's tactical, small unit combat, and on each turn you have impulses, meaning that you have a certain amount of actions that you can do, and vice versa. What you get with this game are five 15 by 19 inch geomorphic maps, probably the most detailed maps you're gonna see in any war game company, 210 one inch counters, one pre-programmed rule book. You read three pages, you play a scenario, you wanna continue, you read a few more pages, you get a little bit more detailed, you play another scenario. This game is designed by Uwe Eicher. He incorporated a mechanic called Chit Draw for damage. So you don't know what kind of damage you're gonna get and neither does your opponent other than the killed in action chit that you could draw. When you draw that damage counter, you put it underneath your chit and only you know how much damage you have. And one is called the berserk. What happens if you draw the berserk thing? Well, your defense goes up, your attack goes up, your movement goes up because you've just lost your mind because you saw your unit being decimated by your opponent. And that's gonna teach him to attack me again. So the designer has a sense of humor, but not really, because in war, there are people and there are animals. So if you look now at both chits, bottom left, you're going to see a soldier with an arrow crossed out through it and a number 10. Well, that just means that you can't see through the cow and you can't see through the person, so it gives you 10 defense more. So what do you do? You shoot the poor cow? You shoot the people? What do you do? This is a card assisted game. You get 55 action cards, which help you destroy your opponent. In this game, there's hidden units, so when you creep up to your enemy and you start shooting, well, you just shot two cows. If you want to play this game solo, there's an expansion called Conflict of Heroes Eastern Front. There are artificial intelligence cards which help you move your opponent. Here's a picture of my dog. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week. Please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. Thank you very much. Hello, fellow gamers. It's that special month, the one filled with self-love, chocolates, and crushing the will of those you hold dear to you. So might I recommend a couple of Kickstarters to ease the pain of that crushing defeat you're gonna feel? Featured this week, we have Yokohama Duel by Tasty Minstrel Games, who's kicking off this month with a romantic two-player game where opportunists gain prestige by placing merchants in the market, building shops, and taking over districts like the ruthless silk hustlers you are for about 45 minutes. Now, a pledge for this game costs $30, and TMG is also offering the original game, Deluxified, on the campaign page. But if you're not too interested in a party of two, then how about a dungeon of five in 
Munchkin Dungeon by Cool Mini or Not, which has taken the Munchkin theme and added a hoard's worth of minis and shenanigans, as two to five Munchkins keep the door makers in business by plowing through the dungeon, harassing defenseless monsters, and of course, leveling up and collecting that sweet, sweet loot, all while trying not to get stabbed in the back by everyone at the table as they become jealous of your fame for about 60 to 90 minutes. A starting price for this romantic getaway in the mountains is $60. Speaking of injuring your painting hand, next up we have Champions of Nexum by Board Legends, which is a MOBA-style game for 1-8 to eight champions looking to PvP in this fantasy scape, while completing quests and taking down opposing teams' towers for 60 to 90 minutes, as players must work together as a team or lay witness to the shame of the floss dance in person. This strategy-based game is, goes for $107, and nothing beats that blank stare you get from whispering, MOBA, into any board gamer's ear. Now, as some of you go look up what the heck MOBA means, let's take a look at Hyperspace by Peterson Games. This is an asymmetrical 4X game for two to four aliens that utilizes area control and has a modular board. Now that I have everyone's attention, let me add that player turns are non-existent. That's right, folks. This drops the playtime down to a mere 20 minutes per player, so you can have your space exploration and your battles, too, for $69. Lastly, we have 1001 Odysseys by Asmodee Games, which is for one to five space cadets looking to explore a handcrafted universe through picturesque scenes, storytelling, and player choices for 30 minutes. Now this game really caught my attention because of the beautiful artwork and unique storytelling aspects that really captured my imagination. A pledge for this fictional beauty costs $75. Thank you so much for joining me this week, guys. If you want to hear any more about the Kickstarters that you saw here today, make sure to join me at 1 p.m. Central Time on Friday as we talk about all the Kickstarters that you saw live where you guys get to comment on what you guys think about them. So other than that, I will catch you guys all next week. All right, so... You know, it's funny because February is usually like the doldrums of getting games in. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like, oh, look at these games. But for game news, they are like plowing through it. Yeah. So we'll start out with Ravensburger. Ravensburger is making actual puzzles that are escape rooms. Um, type, well, that's like a, it's like a to, to solve the puzzle, uh -huh. you need to use QR codes, use a leaflet in the thing, find secrets and figure out how to put this puzzle together. There's multiples of them. And then if okay. all else fails, there's like a secret envelope in the box like, okay, how do I do it type huh. thing. I don't like putting puzzles together. I hate it. Um, but I might do one of these just to try That's it That's interesting. Out. So it is a jigsaw puzzle though. Uh, yeah, it's a jigsaw puzzle, but it's also an escape room. I don't know. In this one, okay. you're building a laser to blow up an asteroid or something to that effect. Hmm. All right. Sounds interesting. So you can just put the puzzle together, too. I don't know. I think don't so. know. Maybe you're maybe missing a, a piece. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe there's like a piece in a. I, I don't. It sounds bizarre, right? It does. Wow. Uh, okay. Or maybe the pieces are two different sides and you don't know which one goes where. Right. Uh, right. Maybe there's extra pieces. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. All right. It's a 750 piece puzzle. It says 759. <laughs> that is a really weird Maybe number. Maybe there's 800 pieces in it, and you only use that many. Who knows? I mean, ah. well, I got to check this out, and then 10 minutes in, burn it from frustration. <laughs> from. All right. On good news, uh, Planet is coming to America from Blue Orange Games. So, Planet was uh, a great, uh, cool game of magnets that you're building, like this dodecahedron globe. And uh, as far as we know, they weren't going to bring it to America, but they are. So that's coming very soon. Oh, okay. Cool. This next news bit, I thought, would have come from Greater Than Games. But it's coming instead from that company that makes some of the most boring-looking games ever, Splatter. So Food Chain Magnet is getting an expansion called the Ketchup Mechanism. I'm not kidding. That sounds like Greater Than Games did it, right? Yeah. Really? Really. Okay, Splatter is being <laughs> silly. Well, they do have, I mean, Splatter, for how heavy their games are, 
they kind of lean into some of the silliness that their games display. Like, what's that one with the space duck or whatever? Oh, that's true. You know, it's got a silly space duck. It's like a super serious game, though. Yeah, but it has a silly, like, little duck on the cover, right? Yeah, you're like... I don't even know what the game's about. I never played it. But I just thought this was hilarious. I mean, this is easily one kind of their of most popular games they've done, mm -hmm. for sure. So I'm surprised that this is like three years after it's come out, this expansion. And is it a catch-up mechanism? It's about catch-up, man. Uh, <laughs> catch-up mechanism and other ideas. Yeah, but here, here's what that says at the bottom. It's not just coffee. It's splatter. We have the meat. A big table deserves a good catch-up. Restaurant now seating up to six patrons. Ooh, New them. menu, original taste. Finger licking good. I'm playing it. <laughs> New exotic flavors available. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Just have a seat. We play with food and we like to play well. In order to enjoy our new options, you need a copy of the original game. How many trite phrases can we stuff into one that's paragraph? Right. They're going to hear from Arby's, that's for sure. <laughs> all right. But people who do like the game will be extremely pleased. Now, here's some really cool news, and this is from Space Cowboys. A new Time Stories series is coming, Time Stories Revolution. This has me excited for two reasons. Mm -hmm. The first reason is the next Time Stories modules, which is... Um, Madame. Madame. Madame from France. I was the least excited about this one of any module. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was considering not playing it. Mm -hmm. But they've now announced it's the last one and it will resolve the story to a point. <laughs> was that what they said or something they like that? They basically said a, a resolution point. of sorts, that sort <laughs> that, of thing. That's really worrisome. It's like, However, okay. I, it's going to resolve, so we're going to play it now. Yes. I'm, I'm much more excited about playing it. I better see Bob die. Right. <laughs> or go to prison. That's top of the for list. Life. <laughs> that is top of the list. I need to find out, uh, you know, who have I been playing for here? The good guys or the bad guys? What is going on? Every yep. one of these threats better be resolved. It's going to be ba basically no game. You just read a novel. It tells you what happened. <laughs> well, they, they in, in the first one, slightly in the second one, the third one, the Prophecy of Dragons for sure. Mm -hmm. Then they stopped the, the big overarching story. They had little clues, but there's all these things. If those mean nothing, <laughs> whoo, I don't know what we're going to do. All right. Um, but so they're starting a new series. They're calling, they're going to do nine of them. But these, they say you can play in any order. Although they technically said that about the other ones, too. They technically said that, and you probably shouldn't. Yeah. But these, these apparently, from what I can tell, they're, they're getting rid of the time thing, which I don't, don't know why it's called time stories anymore then. But you're going to go through. The time jumping part. Yeah. You are still <sighs> traveling, I think, to different places and times. But it's a single leap, I think. And the whole game's supposed to be able to be played in three hours or whatever. So you're supposed to be able to play it in one sitting. Mm -hmm. You go through, and, you, and you, apparently you're not jumping to the thing. You're already there. And then each character, that, each of the receptacles that you're in, will have its own deck. Mm -hmm. And there's no core box for these. They play out of that box you buy. So in other words, this is Unlock 2.0. That's the way it feels to me, because the latest unlocks, two of the unlocks, the pirate ones and the uh, dinosaur adventure one, whatever it's called, right mm -hmm. over there, both of those felt more of an adventure than they felt like an unlock game. Okay. And I would imagine they're going to use that same thing here. That's cool, though. I mean, we'll be able to stick these all in the library at Dice Tower, and people can just get them out and play them. I'm excited yeah, to play cool. these. So, resolution, someone said, Bob is the madam. I love that artwork, too. <laughs> <laughs> that, would be, that would be the twist. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I know. And someone says here they never cared about the overarching story. I get that some people don't care about that, and you'll be glad for the new one. Yeah. But I do care about that. And I, I've i almost stopped watching TV shows that, with these big stories unless I know there's going to be some sort of ending because I find that really frustrating. I don't get in there for the – the little episodes are cool, but if, there, if you have a big story, I need it resolved. Yeah, tell it. Right. All right. Also from Space Cowboys, they're bringing a new two-player series. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest one, of course, Jaipur. They're redoing it. They're going to be in this size boxes here. I don't think I know the other two games. I think they're both new, but I'm not sure. I think that's correct, yes. Jaipur is a reprint. A great um, two-player trading game. An excellent game, and they're kicking off a line of two-player games. The other two are both, from my understanding, new games from that design team. So the first one, Jaipur, is just from uh, Sebastian Pauschen. The other two are from uh, Pauschen and two co-designers that he's been working with lately. My concern here for this line is Jaipur is an excellent game. 
That design team is the design team that now has, from, from Essen, put out two games, and I disliked both. Yep, I agree. So um, Also, the theming there. I'm a little concerned about that. But, hey, Jeff Poor's coming back. Trading in different back. places. Jeff Poor's coming back into print. That's good. Um, I also like the box size. These look like they're, it's a cool little size. Oh, yeah, right, right. So maybe they're good. Maybe they're fantastic. All right, some Target employee, for some reason, decided to put the expansion to Villainous on the shelf. Yeah. It had a certain date that they're supposed to go out, but they get them early. We know this because I'll go into Target and I'll say, hey, according to your website, you have this game. They're like, no, we don't. And like, go check in the back. And they do, usually. Mm -hmm. um, so they get them early. They did, then someone put it out. Someone took a picture. Boom, all over the internet. Yes. So then uh, the company was like, oh, we're going to announce this game. Actually, we're going to get a copy of this next week. So yeah. it's, the, it's ready to go, right? They were just basically playing this really, really close to the chest then. If it's supposed to come out very soon. They haven't mentioned it at all? No, but that's the way that they were, I think, with a lot of their games. Okay. So, anyway, it adds three new villains to Villainous. The Evil Queen, who I think... Which you know, one? Is there... From Snow White. That's one in the, the... Is that the only one that's called the Evil Queen? That seems surprising. Probably so. There's the one... Sleeping Beauty, was that an Evil Queen? I don't remember. She wasn't nice, I bet. No, she, there was a witch. Evil. Yeah, okay. There was a witch, gave her an apple, and she fell asleep, and she could only be awakened by uh, Prince Charming. I've and heard of it. Dr. Facilier, I don't, I don't, that's from the Princess and the Frog one, the voodoo guy. Sure. That one I haven't seen. And then one of my favorite ones, Hades. <laughs> yeah, no, place. well, okay, not in the, <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but. One of my favorite places, <laughs> Hades. I didn't say my favorite places. <laughs> No, but Hades is a hilarious bad guy from Hercules. Uh, all right. So this will be out, like, next week, I think. I guess so. Or maybe now, if you go to the right target. Yeah, right. I've seen pictures of the production. Looks beautiful. Speaking of beautiful production, Aaliyah has their 20th anniversary. They're redoing two of their most well-known games, Castles of Burgundy and Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Castle of Burgundy is first, I believe, then Las Vegas. They'll be coming out with both of them. They're both... Making them look better, although the Las Vegas, which is shown in the picture here, That's honestly look doesn't look that much better, in my opinion. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. That's they're, making they're, them look better? They're having another go at the look of the games. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Wow. Honestly, I thought Vegas, Las Vegas, or Vegas, or whatever it was called, looked all right. Right, I agree. That's what's weird. Burgundy gets lots of garbage for how boring it looks. Sure. But the funniest thing about this whole thing, me and Z were laughing about this. They have a quote in there from the guy in charge of Aaliyah, and he was kind of like, people didn't used to care about production, but apparently that's a big deal these days, so we're going to make our games look better. <laughs> it just was funny. Yeah, it was basically saying, you know, mechanisms and uh, good gameplay is where it's at. <laughs> but I guess, you know, the market has evolved to now need pretty games, so fine. We'll, <laughs> we'll put out prettier games. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting, the way it read. All right. Oh, someone said that the other Villainous was not just an expansion. You can play it on its own. This new Villainous? You know, I guess that's true because each villain comes with all the cards that you need to play the game. So you, you can play a, a three-player game of it. board, though. Don't you need a board? Now you have your own board. Each person has their own board and their two decks of cards. That's all you yeah, need. I guess you're right. All right. Here's something Sam is going to hate. What's one of the most popular games that came out last year that you thought was super overrated? Everyone was going gaga over it, and you played it, and you thought it was meh. You didn't even think it was a game. The Mind. The Mind. They want to make The Mind better. So they are including a soundtrack now that you can play while you're playing The Mind to get you in a mind mood. On CD, because CDs are where it's at. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're going to put out the Mind Retro next year with an 8-track tape. And that's just for the hipsters. I heard that apparently what I read was that part of the reason to have a soundtrack was to not allow people to count in their heads. Like to break up the counting. I guess the tempo goes up or down or something. I don't know. Who's been doing that? Why? Everyone's been doing that. People who play the Mind a lot are like, well, you can just count. You can just count through, like, say, I seconds. I guess. Is like someone one, sitting there going? two, three. <laughs> well, you can't do it. You can't make the sound, I guess. But So apparently the soundtrack is partly for mood, but also partly to <coughs> fix the game. 
That's so... Whatever. Yes. It's also a CD. How many people don't own a CD player at this point? There's a lot of people who don't own a CD player. What's a CD? A, um... What's CD? Most what? of the time we get CDs, we stick them in the car. I ain't playing the mind in the car. <laughs> That'd be awesome. No, it would not be. All right. That's good. Uh, Richard Brees is coming out with an expansion to Keeper called Keeper at Sea, which comes with two parts. One if you are new to Keeper and one if you're really good at it. All right, Game Right has a whole pile of games. They just announced their lineup for the year. Most of these are games that you guys won't care too much about, probably. Uh, Guju Guju Ratatat Roll. Sushi Roll. Ratatat Cat is one of their most popular games, mm -hmm. so they're jumping into this rolling dice, sushi roll, dice game. Um, who's It? Punto, which is looks like one of the... They made a little game like this before, a really tiny game called Iota, I think. Mm -hmm. It looks exactly like exactly. that. Exactly, I think that's what that is. This game goes to 11. Um... Yeah, that when you're arguing over man. over stuff, it's like a party style game and Bloom. Anyway, card game that cranks it past ten. Bloom looks like yet the the next one in the roll and write craze they've been diving into. Yeah, but I don't like that cover. It's so boring. It All looks right. like a lot of the other covers in that same line, actually. Last week we talked about a new game coming from Next Move with four letters. Well, they've changed it now. You can have four numbers. Okay, so the next one here is five two one one. Oh, I haven't heard about this at all. Yep, it's their new game that's coming out. It amazing game matched only by its amazing art, they brag. And that's art is subjective, is what I'll say to that. This looks like a small box, then. This is not going to be the um, the Reef and Azul size box. Now, nah, it looks like it's just a small card game, but it's the next, you know. Why, why would they have that quote? Because well, because some people like nice. that art. This is a weird move. This seems like a very amigo move for a company that has been just destroying it with their sales. Azul. However, Sequel when I first saw Azul. Azul, I was like, I don't know. So this is putting that to the test, though. We'll find out. Also, why it's is it called like 5211? It's, it's a small card game with a forgettable title. And Cards with numbers and colors. One of those kinds of games. Horrible artwork. <laughs> Fantastic artwork, <laughs> but it's just this is gonna be a. They're really trying to test like how much can we sell. You know what I mean? That don't look good to me. I don't man. know. That's an interesting move from them. We'll see. I'm. I'll play it. All right. Last bit of news from today is a new expansion is coming out for Euphoria. Ignorance is bliss, mm -hmm. which is. Quite fitting since there is zero information on the game. He just announced that there's going to be an expansion. And as Jamie has done in the past, whether he did it with Wingspan, he will release a little bit at a time until you see the game come out. I think pre-orders for the game will go up next month uh, or at the end of February, something along that line. Um, this one's interesting. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Euphoria. It was very well regarded, sure. but it didn't get the same adulation that Scythe, Viticulture, and Wingspan is now getting. But it's still a lot of people liked it, so we'll have to wait and see. That is the regular news. Let's go to some contributors. We'll be back soon. Gamers say you can't judge a game by its box cover, but non-gamers disagree. This is Box Theory. In Castles of Burgundy, you are a 15th century prince or princess of Burgundy, collecting and placing tiles in your estate to gain the most prominence. Let's get our first theory. In Castles of Burgundy, you are trying to save a rich person. They pay your bills and taxes. <laughs> That's a good life. Yeah. They also buy your food and drinks to survive. <laughs> Man, I would play that I was game. I going to say, can I, can I like, live in this world? I hope so. <laughs> you attempt to furnish a, furnish a castle with nothing but burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> you really want with the title there. Literal there. <laughs> Just burgundy furniture, walls, everything. <laughs> burgundy carpet. Burgundy uh. dinnerware. <laughs> Okay, in Castle Burgundy, you go through different villages trying to save a princess who is trapped in a castle. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nintendo themed Castle yeah. Burgundy. That would work, actually, I think. I that would work. That. That, that princess Peach's be, Castle, yeah. warp pipes, all that stuff you get out. Yeah, that could work. Huh. All right, and lastly, you attempt to gather poofy Renaissance hats. <laughs> He is wearing a pretty funny hat. Burgundy, playing off the other one. Burgundy. Yeah. Tom Basil would like this. All yeah. about hats. Oh, yeah. How about that, Tom Basil? You might enjoy it more. Do you have a poofy renaissance hat? <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so thanks for tuning in to another Box Theory. Remember to follow us on our social media pages. If you had a game you'd like to see a theory of, or if you have a Box Theory on Castle Burgundy, let us know in the comments below. For BGW, I'm Colby. I'm Steven. And we're gaming for the weekend. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. If you don't already know me from Token Punch Lunch, I am an avid solo gamer, and I will be here on Board Game Breakfast sharing some exciting games that I've been playing recently. Today, I want to talk about a game that has really been fun for me in the last few weeks, which is Pavlov's House from Danverson Games, and it's designed by David Thompson. Pavlov's House is set during the Battle of Stalingrad, and your job is to try to hold out in Pavlov's House, which is a fortified apartment building, against what in real life was an almost two-month onslaught by the Germans. As the player, you're actually going to be playing on two fronts. You're going to be controlling the Soviet soldiers who are inside of Pavlov's house, trying to hold out for as long as they can, but you're also going to be controlling leaders of the Soviet 62nd Army who are trying to get supplies to the soldiers inside of Pavlov's house while also setting up anti-aircraft and maintaining communication lines so that maybe you can take some more actions on future turns. Meanwhile, a brutal German AI deck is going to be messing with your plans, attacking the house, um, bombing your supply lines, and do basically doing everything they can to storm the house and prevent the men inside from surviving. I will warn you that conflict in this game is resolved by die rolls and you can get very unlucky. So if the roll of the die determining your fate is something that frustrates you in games, you might want to give Pavlov's house a pass. If, however, you like trying to do a whole lot with limited resources and under a lot of pressure, and if you really love immersive historical themes that let you live out really crucial moments in history, or in this case military history, then I really recommend Pavlov's House. I think it's a great solo game, it's definitely staying in my collection, and I've had a fantastic time with it so far. Happy gaming! Welcome to a Fellowship of Meeples. This is the show where we talk about the gaming group. Well, over the next few weeks, we plan to share a few tips with you that will help your gaming group be the best it can be. Also, you need to realize that there are basically two kinds of gaming groups, what I call an open and a closed group. Now, a closed group would be a group of maybe three to five people that meet on a regular basis, usually the same people, usually some friends that meet at perhaps a more personal setting, like somebody's home. The second kind of gaming group is an open group, like what we have going on. And uh, we do advertise publicly, and we never know exactly who's gonna show up or how many people are gonna show up, uh, but we do meet at our friendly local game store, and if we do happen to have quite a bit of people, we can easily break it down into individual smaller game groups. Now, the advantage of a closed group is uh, predictability and consistency. Uh, you can most often tell who's going to be there, how many people, and according to that number, you can arrange snacks, seating, and also, more specifically, what kind of games you're going to play. While our open group is a lot less consistent, a lot less predictable, but we love making new friends, which we often do, and when you get a lot of people show up, it kind of gets you a, a atmosphere of excitement, almost like a, a miniature convention. Our question is, are you part of a gaming group? If so, what kind? Let us know in the comments below. Also, let us know about any advantages or disadvantages you see to your particular type of group, and we'd love to know about that as well. If you'd like to see more of what we do, feel free to go to our YouTube channel. It's called Doug and Doug Gaming, and check us out online. And please enjoy the rest of your breakfast. I must regain my honor! <laughs> Tom's going for that. Yes. <laughs> That's my intro. Welcome to 10 for 10, 10, 10. Uh, all right, everybody. Today we're going to be doing 10 actors from DC movies, as in the comics. 10 movies those people have been in. Are they the DC movies? They are not. That would be really <laughs> easy. 
That would be quite straightforward, considering I listed who they played in DC movies over here. So we've got Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill, Gal Gadot, Ryan Reynolds, Will Smith, who played Deadshot, Margot Ro Robbie, Harley Quinn, uh, Christian Bale, the better Batman, Ezra Miller, and Jason Momoa. And then ten movies over here. The Machinist, The Bad Batch. Uh, the Amityville Horror, this means war. Z for Zachariah, The Legend of Bagger Vance, The Count of Monte Cristo, Phantoms, Fantastic Beasts, and Where to Find Them, and Night and Day. I'm going to turn this, uh, the comments away from me so I don't accidentally... There you go. So you guys don't give me an answer, but the people live can play amongst <laughs> We're going to play eight of these ten things so that the final guess, you still have a 33% chance of only getting it right, okay? And before I spin the wheel, I'm going to allow you each to say whether you want to hope for one, two, or three of these explosive barrels. Those are your points, by the way, but they just look cool. Now, if you don't get it, your opponent can steal and they will earn as many as you put on the line. So, you have to decide how many you think you want before I spin. And hey, your odds might go up if the movie. Oh, so we can't pick which one. <laughs> you can't pick. So, oh, who man. lost last time? Uh, it's... We'd have you, to go back and watch the tapes. Does anybody remember who lost last time? <laughs> All right, Tom, so I'll go ahead and start with you then. How many of these would you like? I'm not... I know one, I think, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with two. Two of these. Here we go. Z for Zachariah. Which of these actors was in <laughs> that movie? Okay, let me... These guys have their own list. That's why they're looking at wow. their phones. They're not cheating. All right. Tom put two of these on the line. All right, well... I'm canceling out the ones where I, I know are in other movies. Okay. Z for Zachariah. Oh, man. And I know I was not in this film. I'm going to go with Ezra Miller. That is incorrect. <laughs> Mr. Healy. Two points on the line for you. Uh, um, <laughs> Z for Zachariah, huh? I just watched this last night. Did you? <laughs> it's, I've seen this film. It's... Uh, you have seen it? I have seen it. I have seen it. It is, uh, it's only basically has three actors in the whole movie. It's uh, post apocalyptic, about the most boring post apocalyptic movie you could ever watch. Nothing much happens in it. I'm going to go with. Um, Wait, the apocalyptic movie? I'm going to go with uh, yes. Tom Hardy. That is wrong as well. This is Margot Robbie's film. Mm. Oh, man, there was like. There were so many movies she's you know, been who else in that is I in this know. Movie? One of the in... other actors is Steve Trevor. The guy who played Steve Trevor in uh, Wonder Woman, Chris Pine. We are deactivating that one. Sam, how many points would you like? Well, actually, Z for uh, Zachary, you probably got rid of the off, hardest one. It's off the board, baby. I'm, I'm going to go with three. Three. Oh, yes. Please, please be the one. Please be the one. I know. The Count of Monte Cristo. Well, which one? That came out in 2002. I saw this one in the theater. Did you? I did. The lead is Jim Caviezel in the film and Guy Pearce. Those two are the leads. And that one guy who's... Uh, I... So which of these actors is in that movie as well? Now, we know it's not Margot Robbie. You can cross her off yeah, if you'd true. like, in fact. I did already. Um... Hmm... Who could it be? This is also a very good movie. It really holds up. I actually watched this not very long ago. Ah, uh, it's a little too revengey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it doesn't ever. It doesn't, in my opinion, didn't show enough. Revenge. Like the revenge doesn't. Like revenge. It, it it almost was like revenge is good. That's the way I felt the movie was kind of. I think that's kind of what the book is saying. I'm gonna too. go with Gal Gadot. That is wrong. I don't think Gal Gadot might have been born yet. Um, Actually, she 2002? She wasn't an actress. So she was only 16 <laughs> when she made Wonder Woman. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. She was definitely not an actress. All right, well, Will Smith was not in that movie for sure. And Ben Affleck's too big of an actor to have been there. No, no, not if he's not one of the leads. That's what I'm Correct. saying. sure. So, no, it's not Jason Momoa. Would he have been in that, like, as a background character? Speaking crazy languages. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess Ezra Miller again. That is wrong as well. Henry Cavill is in this film as the son of Mondego. Oh, but I wouldn't recognize him. I don't think. I mean, it how is old pretty was hard he? To like twelve. He looks eleven years old. <laughs> All right. And we're crossing him off, and we are deactivating that film. 
All right, all right, all right. All right, Tom, how many would you like? I'm going to keep going with two because I'm, feel, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling okay You're here. still okay but not quite that sure. Here well, we there's go. Still, there's still one I know. <laughs> this means war. This means war was... Uh... Wait, I'm missing a name on here, aren't I? Is it on your list? Tom Hardy, you didn't mention. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's on there too. There's up only nine on here. Three, right. six, nine, yeah. Is that like a clue? No, I just realized there were only nine names on um, here. This means war is about those two CIA agents who fall in love with the same girl. And then they use the CIA equipment to fight it. I just watched this uh, like a couple months ago. Probably saw it on a plane. It's not. Oh. It's not Ryan Reynolds. You sure you don't want to boost it up to three there? Why, can you boost? I don't want to boost it. Gal Gadot. Nope. That is wrong, but Sam Healy knows. Tom Hardy. It is Tom Hardy. That was a clue. That was kind of a clue. <laughs> uh, here you go, Sam. Good call. You. We played spy off each other. See, I was going to well. guess Tom Hardy, but then I felt like that was, I don't know. No, All right. right. Anyway, Tom Hardy is on the on the list here as well. Sam is once again whooping you. No, I'm not. Here we go, Sam. One, two, or three points for you. <laughs> Might as well do three. Three, you are winning. Okay, one. If you miss this, <laughs> here we go. One point. The Amityville Horror. Oof. Which of these actors? The Amityville Horror. Was in that film. The Amityville Horror. And this yeah. came out, I want to say, in the mid 2000s or no, so I'm, as well. I'm pretty sure Ezra Miller wasn't alive yet because this one came out a long time ago. Or are you talking about the one? It's a remake. It Has was it 2004 or so. Oh, okay. Well, none of these people, none of these actors are like that old. Correct, right, right. I'm trying to think which one of these is the oldest character. Like, which one of these is the oldest actor amongst the, the group? Probably, Probably Ben Affleck. Probably Ben Affleck, yes. Or maybe Christian Bale. Christian, no. They're probably contemporary. Well, they're, yeah, they're, they're pretty close. It's not, a, it's not a movie that Will Smith would be in. He was one of the ghosts. <laughs> Get out of my house! <laughs> Get out. We don't watch our movies, so this is not Maybe so useful for us. Oh, no. I have seen this film, um, though, you and have? it is terrifying. You hate horror movies. I do indeed. So why do you watch so many? Because I, I don't know why I watched this. It was ages ago, like I said, and it is very, very scary for me anyway. I'm sure people out there are saying, come on now, this is Child's, this is Goosebumps. No, Child's, you're about to say Child's Play, but that's child's also a horror also movie. Really scary. <laughs> Who do you think, I'm Sam? Gonna, Actually, I don't I think don't, Child's Play I is that scary. I have no idea, because um, I, I usually don't watch horror movies. So Take a wild I guess. I don't even pay, pay attention to them. I'm going to, and we'll go with Christian Bale. That is not correct. I'm just going to keep guessing Ezra Miller until I get it. Why would you pick the one person who's probably done the fewest films? Because maybe he was a kid in this movie. Okay, that is also incorrect. Ryan Reynolds is the lead in this movie. Sure. <laughs> People, I, we know board games. Of course, don't go back and watch it last week. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, wait. I shouldn't be spitting yet. Uh, ignore, ignore. Okay. I uh, will. This is whose call here? Mine. I, I'm, I'm going to go for the win. Three. Three. Come on. Give me the one I know. Is that The Legend of Bagger Vance? The Legend of Bagger Vance. I'm going to guess Will Smith. You're not guessing, it seems like. <laughs> he knows. Will Smith is in it. Woohoo! You have three points. You know, I still haven't seen the movie, though. What? I know. I keep meaning to. I'm like, I should watch that movie. I'll get around to it. All right, that's it's fine. It's about golf. I it is a it. golfing tale of wonder and right. amazement. Sam, yeah. how many points would you like? Uh, two. Two? All right, very well. The Machinist. Hmm... The Machinist. This is a dramatic picture. About a machinist? About a person. <laughs> <laughs> the actor in this film has done a lot of... That's probably too good of a hint. I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to say um, it. I'm not going to say it. If you haven't seen the movie, it's too bad. It's kind of creepy. It's kind of a creepy movie. I've seen it. Um, you see a lot of movies, man. I'll go with um, 
Don't have a clue. Christian Bale. Christian Bale is correct. <laughs> That's the one I knew because he lost like he lost a eighty lot of pounds weight. or something yes, for this looks, movie. He looks really messed up in it, and then immediately after, gained a lot of muscle to play Batman. Yeah, well, they were really close together. <laughs> Man, that's the one I knew. That's the one you knew. <laughs> yeah. I thought the one you knew was Legend of Bagger Vance. Well, actually, I knew that one too. But I knew Machinist. I I read that fact so many times. Like it's on those lists of facts you didn't know, and it's like Christian Bale lost Christian a ton Bale of weight to insane. playing the Machinist. Right, correct. How many points did you like, Tom? Well, I'm going for the win here. Three. Three points. But I don't know. I'm just going to be guessing. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I have not seen this one. So I'm going to guess. That one I haven't seen either. I'm going to guess Ezra Miller again. I'm That's just... right. Ezra Miller <laughs> is the one in this movie. Yes! You finally did it! And in this movie, he also doesn't know how to run, from what I understand. <laughs> Z, and then one Z final made so one. much fun of him running in that movie. All right. You're I supposed got, to see I got, his I gotta points. go for three. Me, you gotta see his points, man. Three. All right, Sam. Here we go. This is the final one. Is it? There should be two left. No, 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 because we're not doing the last two because it's so obvious. Oh, okay. Phantoms. Jeez. So he has three people here to pick from, right? Correct. So, so your leftover ones are Ben Affleck, Gal Gadot, and Jason Momoa. That's right. Hmm. Phantoms, huh? Well, actually, the other the other two movies are Night and Day and The Bad Batch. Mm -hmm. So that can help narrow down if you know who's in those. Right. Huh. I could tell you what year the film is from if it's going to help. The only one of these three I've seen is Night and Day. Phantoms, Phantoms. Oh, maybe. Have I seen The Bad Batch? I don't even know what The Bad Batch is about. I, I'm pretty sure you have not. That's also post-apocalyptic. What is with all these post-apocalyptic movies? That's really messed up. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Jason Momoa. That is not correct. Oh, I got a 50-50 chance here? I don't know. Um, You've won anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Ben Affleck. That's right. It's a Ben Affleck movie from 96. 96? Woo! Oh I, I want to know who's in Night and Day, because Night and Day is a Tom Cruise movie, right? Yes. Gal Gadot is in it. Yeah. Who yeah. is she playing? Like she plays someone he talks to. She's... Um, <laughs> he has... There's a scene where they go, he's... That's what I was going to It's about halfway that. through the movie. She's having a meeting with him. Um, he's running from the authorities or whatever his branch is. She's with those people. Wow, I wouldn't have guessed that. I was... But again, she's done very few movies. This is probably one of the newest ones, except for Fantastic Beasts. So there you go, Tom. It looks like you won. Yep. Yay! All right, you can get him next time. Yes. All, All right, right, well, that's our game show. Let's go back to some contributors. <laughs> Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship you face. At least that's what my group decided to name the ship. Hey everyone, Chris Renshaw here from the Boards and Swords podcast. And today I wanted to talk about a sci-fi RPG that's not Star Wars. And that is Star Trek Adventures from Modifius Entertainment. This game is all about creating characters, putting them on ships in the Federation, and then letting them go out and explore adventures in kind of a stylized, episodic fashion like your favorite Star Trek series. Now, the game uses a system that Modifius has used in other games called the 2D20 system. And the way this works is whenever it comes time for you to roll dice for a skill or a task, the GM will tell you that this task is a certain attribute and a certain discipline. If you're trying to navigate a spaceship, then youths may be control and con. Well, each of these stats will have a number and you'll add those numbers together to get the target score that you need to roll under. So then you take your 2d20 or potentially you can use story in-game mechanical bonuses to give you more dice and you'll roll the dice and try and score under that target number. Now, depending on the type of skill, the GM will set a value between 0 and 5, and that's how many times you have to succeed in order for the overall task to be successful. It's a really cool system, and it definitely gives you that Star Trek feel of letting you, because there's a little bit of give that you can do, or like, well, my character's probably more daring than he is reasonable, so can I use this daring and con, because I'm like whipping my ship 
or you know my shuttle in a specific way to out to avoid some gunfire and these stats are built up by telling the story of how your character got to be where they are in Starfleet really well done system that takes kind of the heart of scientific wonder and exploration in Star Trek and really puts it into a sci-fi game that's like a sci-fi mystery exploration game it is not a straight up we're just taking the ship through space and blowing up everything that's in our path have you played the star trek game do you have any desire to play the star trek game let me know down in the comments as well and also you can always ask me any sort of other questions in the comments and i'll answer them on future segments in the meantime, make sure you follow me on social media. Send me any comments or questions you have there as well. Subscribe to the Boards and Swords podcast. And until next time, may all your hits be crits. Have you played Concordia? How about Concordia Venus? I will talk briefly about it and what I think about it coming up. Hi everyone, it's Stella from Maple University. Our passion is to explain board game rules clearly on YouTube. On our channel, we do a lot of board game videos, including vlog just like this one. We have been a big fan of Concordia. Now, we have played Venus recently, and this is an absolute game changer for us. We have never played anything like this before. In Concordia Venus, the basic game is similar to Concordia. You still play cards from your hand and do the actions. However, there is an option for players to form teams, two versus two or two versus two versus two. The cards that you use to take action is similar but slightly different from Concordia. Your partner would sit across from you or the furthest away from you. So on your turn, you play a card, you take your action and then your partner in your team will then do the same action as it says on your card. Your partner is not required to play a card. And then the turn moves to the next person and that person plays a card. And his or her partner will then do the action without having to use the card. And then so on. So on your turn, not only you have to care what you can do, but you have to look at what your partner can do efficiently. Most cards will dictate the same action. However, some cards will tell you that you do one action and your partner will do a different action. There's an action that you really want to do. However, you cannot openly communicate to your partner. So you're hoping that your partner will do the action that you'd like to do. You still score individually with the cards. However, at the end of the game, you and your partner's score is combined and the team with the highest score wins the game. And thanks for watching. If you enjoy my segment, please consider checking us out on YouTube. Until next week. Hey there, everyone. I'm Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages, pushing some cubes with this week's segment from the page to the table. I am joined today with the Two Ton Porcupine Studio team of... I'm Carl. Larry. And I'm Doug. Hello. And you may recognize Doug from Board Game Breakfast as the... A board game maker. So an excellent pairing this week of a book and a board game sharing a theme, and that is The Watchmen and Kapow. I read Watchmen last year, and I had never read it before, and I was blown away by this. Um, everything that everyone had ever said about this was right on point. So I'd like to pass it off to Carl to talk a little more about Kapow. So as you can probably tell, Kapow is a superhero themed game, and the three of us really wanted to take um, the idea of dice rolling and mitigate as much luck as possible. Um, the way we got to do that was the combination of the roll in place mechanism in the game, um, which allows for tons of choices no matter what you roll. Um, you can do a lot of different things with your dice roll. Plus we uh, made these very unique buildable dice that allow for customization as you put on faces, um, which you can add, remove, upgrade, and build as you go. So that's probably the coolest thing to me about the game. Throughout the game, you're placing your dice on attack, defense, or power up. What I really love about it is the tension between you and your opponent. All these dice are placed behind a screen, so you don't know if your opponent is loading up on attack, do you need to defend, or can you allocate dice to power up and gain more for the late game. And last but not least, we have three heroes and three villains that are playable within the game. So they actually add a fourth board to the game, give you specific powers for your hero and your villain, allows for loads of replayability. 
that's all for this week. I'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Yeah, I know, but okay, so <laughs> I'm trying here. All right, so we have a... We're going to open something from Home Depot. <laughs> Apparently. So this for this week, and we'll try to do this each week, we'll open a box and see what's inside the box. Hopefully, it's a game. I'm pretty sure it's a game because they spelled my name V-A-S-S-A-L, and that means... And it's not from Amazon, so I only got two kinds of boxes in my house, Amazon and games. What about if it's just okay. spare parts from the Home Depot? <laughs> All right, so let's find out what's right, in this box. Let's see what this it's actually, is. There's, there, it feels like it's a. You better look into it before you know you, you just Brandon, bust it open. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Brandon Renshaw, Zavaro Incorporated in Denver, Colorado, sent this to us. So, um, go ahead. Sure, you want me to do yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Let's find all out. All right, all right. Here we go. <laughs> That's like a Men in Black thing. <laughs> the tentacle comes out. Let me just make sure that we open you know this one first. Yep. Um, it's a, I'm telling you, it's a game. It's definitely a rectangular object. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. It's bubble wrap! Oh, orange bubble wrap. That's like... Oh. And then you always got to do this. Nope. All right, here we go. What is it? What it's is, called what's in the box, man? Dinogenics. No, we need that. That's like a FAQ. All right. Ooh, Dinogenics. Dinogenics. Yeah, so this is a Got game it. that was on Kickstarter last year. I remember reading about it that was, well, Jurassic Park, the board game. Mm. So we already had the one, Dinosaur Island, which came out from Panasars. Some people are saying this one's more interesting. Well, let's see what's inside the box. Ooh, Dino Meeples, which I will replace with those little plastic ones. What do you mean? Those are cool looking. Yeah, they are pretty cool looking. This one does not have that pink motif that Dinosaur Island does. That right, the 80s thing. So play uh, plays one through five people, ages 14 and up, 90 minutes. And you are, this is Isla Sorna or Isla Nublar? Which one? Wow, now he's just showing off his yeah, Jurassic what, what Park are you, knowledge. What are you doing? That was a joke. It was a Jurassic Park. Park geek. It was a Jurassic nerd. Park joke. <laughs> Somebody out there Park was like, operations <laughs> manual. All right, Ooh, I'll take a look cool. here. Oh, recess board. Yeah, yeah I like recess, recess boards. boards. are cool. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, there's a lot of recess boards. Man. Wow, this is, this is actually really neat looking. Hey, maybe we'll play this for our testing Tuesday next week. Man, this is nice. I don't want to get eaten by no dinosaur. I ain't afraid, afraid of no dinosaurs. Dinosaur. Yeah, these Who are you gonna call? He's put out really Chris easy. Pratt. Jeff <laughs> Goldblum. I'm not calling Jeff Goldblum. He no? sits around and gets wounded. And he no, complains. come on now. He knows what's up. He's uh, a good uh, chaos um, uh, theorist. theorist. <laughs> Had to help you out there a little bit. Uh, Here's the board. Not double-sided. I thought this was supposed to be your segment. What's going on right now? Nah, it's okay. What do I care? Nice. I'm, you're running the game show for me next week. All right. Wow, that's really close to the Jurassic Park symbol, isn't it's it? It's a skull. No, it's not. That's what a skull looks like mm, for a T-Rex. That's what a dinosaur thing looks like. True. This looks pretty cool, actually. No, it does. Looks really neat. All right. Ooh, a bag. It says Dinogenics <laughs> on it. Come cool. on, is there meeples in there? Man. Meeples. Yeah, but these are like the humans. T-Rex meeples. Uh, it's called the snacks. And it looks Those like Velociraptor Velociraptors. Velociraptors. Those are always, you and should always breed them if you're going to start a And then train them. <laughs> those, are those the little tiny thingies? Uh, the ones that come in the car, and the ones that got it went after that kid in the first movie, and a whole bunch. Yeah, I don't know what those look are. like. Walls. So all those boards yeah, had all, all spots these, for right, gates right, right, and walls. Right. Man, the pieces for this look great. Yeah, they do. these dinos, goats, goats, food. <laughs> That's. It's so funny, you know, how much of that original Red Jurassic shirts. Park movie is iconic. I still huh? remember them Red lowering shirts. that goat. Red shirts, probably, yeah. People that are going to just die. These are the people that are like, oh, there's no heat signature in there. I may walk in and find out <laughs> while I'm eating a sandwich. And these, are, these look like the... the um... These are the big boys. 
Yeah. These wow. these are the ones that when you see them on the screen, the music swells. Wait, we might get YouTube. All right. So that's pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to grab Lara, Lara Dorn, D and Dern's are, head and turn it. There are five red shirts that have their own bag. <laughs> that thing, you know. You know you're not on camera, right? I know, it's just funny to me. Those dice are cool. Oh. Yeah. They're we engraved. are on camera. They're engraved. This looks really good, actually, yeah. It does. I mean, All right, this is, well, I'm hoping for the best there, then. here as well. You want me to open these? Nah, I think that's good. We'll save that yeah. for the... It's good. I have to say, when it comes to this production, they spared no expense. <laughs> oh my goodness. Come on, man. Wow. You have to. All right, let's go to the next more contributors. Jeez. It's your turn. Ooh. I'm ready. I'm Ellen. Hey, guys. Welcome to We Game Together. We're talking about Carpe Diem. Yes. It's hot off yes. the table. We just got finished playing yes. it. Yes. Which is why I have this distant yes. far okay. <laughs> I like this one a lot. <laughs> I am not kidding. After the game, his eyes literally glinted. They were really, glinting really good. with love. I was like, I remember that look when you fell in love with me. Now you fell in love my with me. My second this. love. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but ugly game. Do we think it's but ugly? It's pretty but ugly. Oh, here's my thing. It's I don't think it's that ugly. I think it's so Tiny. It's, that was yeah, my issue. I guess that's when I was it. looking at pieces, I was squinting, like a squinty McSquinterton. The opponents could are a little lacking, but they're not mm -hmm. bad. Like the cardboard's pretty good. Yeah. They do have some wooden tokens. Mm -hmm. They have the wooden meeples. Yeah. Uh, that are like the Romans. Um, it's it's not as bad as how some people are putting it. I know that the the difference between the green and the the dark green, and the light green back tiles yeah. is kind of interesting. That's that a little was bit not too a, close. That was not enough. And also the gold and brown building that's been like an yeah, issue, which I could yeah. totally see because the first like half hour of the game I kept Yeah, it's like, definitely got comparing. flaws. No yeah. question. It's got flaws, all right? Let's get over that. <laughs> but the gameplay is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> um, it does play so well. What was your favorite thing about the game, I guess? I don't know. Everything you can do, like managing, you know, your short-term, mm -hmm. short-term, uh, goals to your mid game goals to your end game goals is all like all that is kind of a yep. do i sacrifice now to go later or whatever it's good awesome um there's a component in it that i liken to uh isle of sky how you kind of look ahead to what you are going to be scoring with these little cards yeah. that are off to the there's side there's some and cards I, off to yeah. the side that you can uh know what's coming up you try to get get them yeah. to score you always score two cards if you can't score one of the two cards you get minus points which happened, what, only once? It so I don't know if that's time. like a huge yeah. thing. Maybe it is with three or four players. It might be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know. we didn't feel that at yeah. two. But it was great at two. I it really want to try it at three and four. I think it would be really good, really yeah. tight at three and four, too. So that would be, that'd be really good to try. Mr. Glint Eye. That's your new name. is <laughs> Glinty Eyes. Glinty. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, Carpe Diem, guys. Yeah, really good. Definitely, definitely check it out. There is like a new version coming out that fixes oh, yeah. one or two of those issues, oh, apparently. I just found out like two days after I bought it. Yeah. So that might be a thing to wait for. But I don't know. I didn't think it was bad enough to, to wait or anything. So it didn't bother me. Definitely pick this one up. <laughs> yeah, really good. For sure. And the picture of the day. And you can find us on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, All the and things. Instagram. All those things. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Factory Funner. So this is a tile laying game where you're trying to build a factory of your own. You also have a puzzle element along with a real time element. So let me show you a little bit about the game and why I really like it. Players will be handed eight tiles face down in which they will pull one tile every round. In the first phase, every player will take the topmost tile from their stack and simultaneously all players will flip over their tiles. Players are allowed to take any one of the flip tiles. If they are the first player to take a tile, they will be docked one point. If they are the last player to take a tile, they will be given a bonus point. Once a player has taken a tile, 
Then you can begin phase two, in which you build your factory. Every machine will have some inputs along with some outputs, along with some points. You will need to feed your machine certain inputs of color. This machine will grant me points. However, everything I add into it or out will also be negative points. When adding another machine, you can easily output into a different machine. If one machine feeds into another, then you gain a bonus by placing your chip onto that feeder or input of your original machine. That will give you bonus points at the end of the game. At the end of eight rounds, your puzzle may look like this. There are several placement rules to follow throughout the game. You'll add up your points throughout the game and your bonus points at the end, and whoever has the most points wins. So this game comes in two different parts. The first part being the real-time element, where players are timing each other. You can play as fast as you want. However, you might want to pace yourself in case you're looking for that right machine that'll fit perfectly with your factory. But if you're a little too slow, then you might not get what you really want. The second part is placing that machine tile, which might work out for you. However, most of the time it doesn't. So you have to figure out by using different types of pipes and moving things around. And that's the puzzliness that I love of this game. The puzzle mixed with the timing of grabbing these tiles is what I really enjoy in Factory Funner. Well, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Happy breakfast, everybody. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about Goo Gong. Now, this game has a really cool, interesting mechanic that has thematic ties at the core of it. Effectively, to do any of the seven actions, so that's like traveling, you could potentially be moving your envoy, which you kind of have to do towards the palace, uh, to buy jade that's gonna get you points. Whatever you're doing on the board, you have to give a gift, or exchange a gift at least. Effectively, if your gift is better than the one that the official there already has, you're going to be able to do this action. If it's not as good, then you might need to pay a little extra, otherwise you just swap cards. These cards are almost like worker placement, because you're, rather than just completely blocking an area, if you put a high number there, you're inflating the cost to do that action for someone else. It doesn't stop them doing it, but it makes it harder, and you've used that action. So it's kind of like worker card placement, and that's a really interesting way of doing it. But why is it thematic? And that's because actually the, the way they got around the, the bribery or the amount of bribery that was occurring, they said you couldn't take bribes, but exchanging gifts, now that's perfectly acceptable. So <laughs> I really love the way they've instilled sort of that logic into the game and actually made almost made a core mechanic out of it. The game itself, I love the look of the board. It's, it's absolutely beautiful artwork. The core mechanic doesn't let you down either, but it does start to feel a little samey after a few games. And that's because there's a few rules that mean you have to do a certain thing. So that despite there being seven actions, seven ways you can do things, there's one central one and that's the envoy that you're forced into doing. But otherwise, it's good to play, but maybe not to own on your shelf for an extended period of time. Anyway, that's Goo Gong, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast episode. Cool, cool, cool. We will be back at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time to give you the top 10 things to get us excited about new games. Um, huh, I just thought of one. Anyway, um... No, it's not going to be on my Exciting. list. No. <laughs> Dinosaurs. <laughs> Done. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, so join us back there and then later on tonight at 8 o'clock. Hey, we appreciate, once again, all our contributors for putting all the stuff together. We appreciate you guys. Uh, this show is going to kind of morph and change. You'll see how different things will happen as the weeks go by. If you're coming back for another Board Game Breakfast, we'll see you Monday. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Thank you. Sam Healy. See you on the flip side, folks. Take care. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., 
an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.